um, today's lecture, it's really going to be more, more of a lecture, um, unfortunately, just because of, of the amount of material we're going to cover and the fact that we're using, um, that we're looking at a large number of people on Zoom. Um, of course, I know that's not how you'll, you'll teach it in the classroom, um, but hopefully this will give you some kind of overview of connecting Armenian Genocide, the Armenian Genocide and the recent war in Nagorno-Karabakh as well as connecting the war um, this, this fall in Nagorno-Karabakh with, with other uh, geopolitical activities event and events that are occurring simultaneously um, around, the, around the world. So the, we'll start, we're going to start with the Karabakh war and then go into um, looking at how the Armenian genocide relates to it, mainly because hopefully some of you already have some background on the Armenian genocide. And, and the war though is, is more, I think it can be rather complicated in terms of what news coverage happened given all the events that were going on at the time um, this fall. And so in late September, Azerbaijan attacked Armenia. I'm sorry, attacked, uh, attacked Nagorno-Karabakh which is controlled by ethnic Armenians and um, with the help of, of Turkey. And in this, you'll see a map of the region. So this area that we're talking about, it's a, it's a, it's a tiny, tiny little piece of, of land. It's, um, it's approximately the size of Connecticut. And so you can also see though that like with Armenia, um, these, are, these, are land, these are both landlocked and um, border Azerbaijan, you have Russia, Georgia, Iran, and, and Turkey. So the historical roots um, go when we won't go through a full discussion of that either because it's a it's a long long complicated history for this small piece of land the size of Connecticut Nagorno Karabakh also known as Artsakh to Armenians, um, but the first mention of Artsakh comes as early as um, in, in relationship to Armenia as early as uh, as the 700s B.C. before a common era. Um, or BCE, and so this is this is an incredibly ancient place for ethnic Armenians, and ethnic Armenians have always been present in this space and have been a majority in this space. I think some of the lowest numbers have been eighty to seventy percent of the population was ethnic Armenian. So, so an overwhelming majority of of people living in this space have been have been Armenian. Um, Nagorno-Karabakh, um, since since um, since the late since the late '90s, has been um, an ethnically Armenian territory. Like I said, it's historically Armenian. It was it was only ceded to the to Azerbaijan under Soviet rule. It has been over the periods the centuries that it has existed. It has been conquered by multiple people, from you know from Persians to to um, to um, to Russians, etc., and but but most recently in current history, um, after after the Armenian genocide, uh, the this zone was also a, attacked in the early 1920s, um, and then and then once it was taken under all of our, of of Azerbaijan and Armenia was taken under um, Soviet control, the Soviet Union determined to. Uh, to place this piece of land that is ethnically Armenian in Azerbaijan's control. But as the Soviet Union started to break up, um, it was voted on within Nagorno-Karabakh that it would be an autonomous state. And even, and even um, and, and so in this autonomous state, um, it would, you know, it would, it would maintain separateness from Azerbaijan. Um, after the Soviet Union fell and Armenia gained independence, um, Azerbaijan wanted the territory of, of Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh back. And, um, and a war ensued to ensure that, that um, at the time that Nagorno-Karabakh, again, Artsakh, would, would stay with, with under Armenian ethnic Armenian control. But since the ceasefire in the late 90s, there have been regular attacks by Azeri forces on, on, this, on this land. And it has not been recognized internationally, despite the fact that the inhabitants of the land you know, have 
are, are originally from the zone. Armenia is, a, is, is, is of course naturally attached to Nagorno-Karabakh because of um, its ethnic, um, its, 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 its shared ethnic heritage um, being both our Armenians. And, um, and Armenia came, has always defended uh, Artsakh against uh, Azerbaijan and, and Turkey as they have, um, have continued, especially uh, Azerbaijan over the years attacked um, Karab uh, Artsakh's borders. Armenia is, has a democratically elected um, government. This, this is important in terms of the geopolitics. Uh, Nikol uh, Pashinyan is the uh, prime minister of Armenia. Uh, it's a landlocked country with limited trade possibilities. Much of Armenia faces economic hardship and less than 3 million people actually live in Armenia today and it has um, a growth rate that lingers around zero. Um, Armenia has tremendous challenges that um, we'll talk about and, and a bit later because that are directly related to the genocide and and I'm going to use this term a few times in the in the, uh, the workshop but this existential threat of survival of, of not being able to survive. Azerbaijan on the other hand um, as quite is quite different it's it's an autocratic rule it Ilyam Aliyev has no term limits he succeeded his father and um, it is assumed that when Aliyev no longer can hold office, that his wife will will then hold office. This is this is a family based um, uh, oligarchy. Um, it it also is facing currently some economic crises because it's an oil based economy. But since World War One, it has and then and also and, and more specifically since the fall of the Soviet Union, it has prospered greatly. Uh, economically, but that money has not, that economic gain from being an oil-based economy has not trickled down to the people of Azerbaijan. It has stayed within the Aliyev family and um, upheld a really quite tremendous, tremendous lifestyle for them. Azerbaijan has deep ties with Turkey and considers, um, and is considering a stronger relationship with Russia. And so it is. Um, its ties with Turkey are are very much ethnically based. Um, Azerbaijan and Turkey are both Turkic states, and um, and see themselves as having a brotherhood. Turkey also lacks um, democratic ideals. Uh, Erdogan has been in power since two thousand three. Um, he has held multiple dubious elections with extremely questionable results, and um, he um, he has a a, a long um, history of human rights violations against perceived political opponents and um, minorities in Turkey, um, which include Armenian minorities in Turkey, but also um, and, and most especially these days Kurds. Um, face tremendous, um, uh, tremendously difficult hurdles in terms of being accepted into mainstream society. Um, the growing political uh, policy of neo-Ottomanism is a tremendous issue for the Middle East and North Africa. Just recently on our news screens in the US, um, we've had some news pieces pop up about Libya. And Libya was one of the first uh, real actions of Turkey in terms of this neo-Ottoman Ottomanism policy. Um, the policy is quite simply that, um, or in simple terms, is that uh, Turkey feels that it, it is it was um, it was cheated at the end of World War One with the with the settlement of Vers uh, Versailles, and um, and deserves to have an opportunity to expand to its its reach to where it was during Ottoman Empire. This is really interesting because Turkey's always separated itself and said that it, it is a separate government than the Ottoman state. But now they're saying that they're not, they weren't aren't separate. Um, they are they are the Ottoman state and they deserve the lands that Ottomans quote lost in the end of World War One. But we also need to remember that those lands um, were under um, uh, were colonized by the Ottomans. And therefore by losing them, they were going back to their ethnic um, and uh, indigenous inhabitants. 
So um, the, this shows uh, just kind of the, the strength of friendship uh, and, the, and the brotherhood between, um, between Azerbaijan and Turkey and Turkey's ongoing support for Azerbaijan. Uh, in the, this, this second image, um, uh, Erdogan is quoted in, um, in this particular event as saying, Turkey has stood by Azerbaijan from the beginning of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. At some point, Karabakh will eventually uh, inevitably return to its rightful owner and become a part of the Azerbaijan about a part of Azerbaijan again. And so you can see that this is not just something an act orchestrated by Azerbaijan, but also by by Turkey. Unfortunately, we always know that other players in, um, in any given um, conflict are going to include uh, commercial interests and um, one of the things that Azerbaijan has that is very, uh, not Azerbaijan, excuse me, that um, Artsakh has that is very special is, a, is, is gold mines. And um, this is a, a picture of John Sununu um, and, and Aliyev in 2016. Um, John Sununu is, is going to be gaining 50% um, of uh, acquisitions from mines that have been um, taken, currently taken from Armenians in, in, the, um, in the Artsakh region. So this is part of uh, just a, a piece that kind of indicates his, his, um, what, what will be gained and, um, and what new territories will be um, mined under um, John Sununu's um, uh, organization, cor corporation that he has a part in, which is Anglo-Asian uh, Anglo mining. Uh, this is a tough, I know this is a tough image to, to see on the screen, but um, it's, it's just a, it's a more supposed to be a reminder image that, that Azerbaijan um, may not be a country that students will certainly be able to quickly identify on the map. Um, it may not be a country that they'll even be able to give three facts about before starting a lesson on Azerbaijan. But regardless, Azerbaijan has been working heavily within the United States for, for decades to build um, strong um, alliances with um, US politicians and, and US corporations. And, and this is just, so this kind of shows that web of Azerbaijan's um, influence in, in American, American life. And Azerbaijan, they, their, their reach has been, again, it has this a corporate feel, even um, beloved American institutions, I don't know, beloved, but American institutions like McDonald's are more than willing to take up the um, Azeri cause and um, in, in Azerbaijan during this. And if you'll notice, so this is a McDonald's ad and it read that Karabakh is Azerbaijan. So taking an extremely political um, position on, on, on ceding territory that's ethnically Armenian to, um, to, to uh, Turkic uh, Azerbaijan. One of the other major players, which is one of the most um, concerning in a lot of ways is that is, is Russia. So what Armenia and, and Artsakh have always been able to rely on Russia as a uh, stalwart um, uh, friend, um, is particularly against Turkic forces. And this time uh, things were different. And, and it was one of the greatest shocks for, for Armenians as we went through this, the process of the experience of the war this fall. And, um, and Russia, um, is, is, is changing its geopolitical alliances. Um, it's um, pulling, one is that it's looking at pulling Azerbaijan and Turkey further away from Europe. Um, part of that process would be destabilizing NATO. Turkey is a, a NATO member, but if Turkey leaves NATO and forms alliances, stronger alliances or continues to form strong alliances with, with Russia, then, um, the role of NATO in the Middle East um, will be significantly compromised. The last point is punishing a democracy. Um, 
the issues in Nagorno-Karabakh are not the only issues on on Russian on Russian essentially Russian borders right now, but there's um, there's a plethora of issues surrounding Russia and old SSRs in which um, these countries like Goristan, um, Belarus, um, which we saw quite a bit of activity this fall, um, even Ukraine are looking to change their dynamic and have been looking to change their dynamic with, with Russia and establish more formally independent democracies. Amongst that list is Armenia. And, and a few years ago, Armenia was successful in a revolution against the oligarchs that had controlled Armenia and instituted a democratically elected president. Russia's concern with this is that, that um, they gain quite a bit financially and strategically from oligarchs who ran um, you know, autocratic campaigns and in a democracy, uh, Russia will not be able to benefit um, from, from the wealth, any wealth created or any st strategic alliance um, with the countries in the same way. So in part, we saw the, the way that Russia played a role in, in ending the conflict as a punishment for Armenia's role uh, um, movement towards um, becoming a firmer democracy. So one of the people that you're not seeing here, you're seeing American corporate interests, but you're not seeing the US. And, and one thing that was hopeful that we also hoped for was that because Armenia is a um, is an emerging democracy and that through the Minsk group and other international organizations, um, there's been the promise of supporting um, emerging democracies, particularly in the Caucasus, that, that something would have happened um, some reaction from the United States in support of Armenia and Artsakh would have occurred and, and, and the US was silent. Azerbaijan with Turkey's full financial support um, attacked Armenia during a pandemic. While that alone is not a war crime at this point um, to be attacked during a pandemic, we certainly hope that in the future that will be considered. But some of the war crimes that we do, we are aware of was the use of cluster munitions, which harm civilians and leave um, remnants comparable to landmines. Um, historic sites um, like the Shushi Holy Savior Cathedral were severely damaged after being deliberately bombed. And we also saw the bombing of medical establishments, including a maternity hospital. The use of white phosphorus munitions um, by Azerbaijan was another war crime committed um, because these, the white phosphorus, the reason for them is to destroy forests. Probably the most concerning um, war crime that was committed um, was heavily facilitated by, by Turkey. And it's the same issues that we're also seeing in, in Libya. And that's the Turkey's use of Syrian mercenaries. Um, you know, I think everybody, I think we just say poor Syria these days. I mean, the Syria is such a destroyed place and the war had gone, has gone on so long that essentially, or has had gone on so long that it left an entire um, group of, of people without education and without, and without work. And, and their only role, the only thing they know how to do is fight. And Turkey has taken great advantage of using mercenaries from Syria to both commit uh, war crimes in, in Libya and in, in Artsakh. There are even horrendous discussions about, um, about Syrian mercenaries receiving not just payment, but bonus payment for, um, for, for beheading Armenian soldiers, for, for practicing torture techniques and, um, and hopefully, hopefully these, these issues will be solved in an in international court before Turkey can use these uh, mercenaries in, uh, in other parts of either the Caucasus or, or the Middle East. So because, with the force of Russia behind, and this is Pashinyan, the, um, this is an image of Pashinyan, the prime minister of, um, of, of Armenia with tremendous pressure on Pashinyan. 
Uh, he signed a peace agreement um, on November uh, 10th, 2020. The peace agreement um, was a huge blow to, um, to, to Artsakh as well as to, to Armenia. So Artsakh had to handle, they had to hand over um, territories, tremendous amount of territories that included mines. Um, they lost um, historic, historic lands um, and, and had to evacuate from, from their homeland. This is an image of some of the evacuations. You also hear in the news that uh, Armenians uh, burned homes before they left. Um, they also though actually literally would try to get their homes up off the ground and put them on trailers to take them out. They're going to Armenia itself proper that has zero resources for them and, um, and has no, um, and, and they're gonna be living as, as refugees. They're, they, they are taking as much, much as they can. And as far as the, the places, um, you know, any devastation that you may have seen in the news that was left behind, um, Armenians have poured um, both from within Artsakh and from the diaspora has poured in um, millions upon millions of dollars to create an infrastructure that was not there when, um, when Artsakh, when Nagorno-Karabakh uh, regained independence in the late 90s. And so none of those, none of the things that you saw destroyed were ever in the hands of Azerbaijan and nor were Armenians being compensated in any way for all the losses that they are now enduring um, with the signing of the agreement. I think it's fair to ask, and I think certainly high school students, middle school students will ask, you know, why should we care? Um, this is a tiny little place, um, like you've said, said, the size of Connecticut, and and it's an and and I think quickly uh, international news as well as a student's mind will say, oh, it must be an it's an ethnic rivalry. There is no answer, and of course there is an answer when when you have you know uh, indigenous people living on indigenous lands. That's the right. That's the way things should be. Um, and, and obviously that's not what happened here. But, but if we wanna go beyond the, the moral issue that indigenous uh, groups deserve to live in their historic lands, we can look at the geopolitical implications that will have a tremendous effect on us. And that again goes back to what I was saying earlier, which I think is really one of the most important points is that, that Russia is, 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 and, and Turkey are repositioning um, their role as, as, as world leaders. It's something we've been watching for quite a while and, um, and been impacted in our own elections in, in some ways. But I think that the bulk of this is being um, focused on, on um, sovereignty within the Middle East and, um, and, and foreign influence in the Middle East. And if Russia and Turkey are able to continue in the manner that they are, um, there could very well, I think it's a, I personally, I think that there's a huge possibility of, of Turkey exiting um, NATO and, and us seeing um, almost an, uh, an opposite uh, or extreme response to, to Arab Spring, where we see um, kind of after 10 years ago, after Arab Spring, um, we've seen all this movement. And then I think what Turkey wants to do is, is again, destabilize um, the Middle East and North Africa to reclaim um, dominance over this, over this region, um, which again, will have absolutely devastating effects for both, both Europe and the United States and, and, for, the, and for those living within those, those regions. Also, um, and for you all who are, are history teachers out there, you'll recognize this, this picture that it's, it's, um, it's uh, Franz Ferdinand um, a day before he was assassinated. And we also know that when you have, so in the case of Franz Ferdinand, which his assassination sparked the beginning of World War I, that when you have these kinds of sparks, uh, these kinds of incidences that happen, and seemingly small places that sometimes the repercussions um, with the with how alliances line up can be can be quite quite tremendous. So 
So um, Walter Benjamin, it's a German name, um, he and, and others have obviously coined this term as well, that history is written by the victors. Um, he was a victim of the Holocaust. Uh, he, was a, he was a philosopher who was a victim of the Holocaust and uh, killed himself in, in Spain to avoid extradition to Germany. Um, he was one of the greatest thinkers lost to the Holocaust. And, and, and his, his, I think this statement is so um, powerful coming from, uh, um, from someone who, who essentially did not survive the Holocaust because his, um, his suicide was directly related to um, fear of, of being uh, forced back um, into France from, from Spain and interned. That, um, that, that at this moment, and we and I, we do think I think within those who are are looking at the situation closely do believe that maybe there are still chances for things to change, um, but at this moment Azerbaijan is the clear winner, and they're already they've already started making moves in terms of rewriting the history of this region, um, with a with a sense that they can because they were the victors. There's an it's an existential, yet again, existential threat. Almost immediately after the war, the first thing that came up um, that we saw in uh, American media was Google Arts and Culture that Azerbaijan went in and renamed our historic Armenian sites, calling them Albanian Christian architecture. So immediately there was a renaming uh, and erasing of Armenian history from our historic land, which is the same thing we've seen with, with Turkey. It's also, um, Azerbaijan has a second, a first example of this, which is, which is the warning sign of we know what's coming is with Nahichevan. Um, there was a warning um, that there was, there was a tremendous number of, um, this is an area, a zone controlled by Azerbaijan. And if you can see with this numerical data, essentially, um, Historic churches, um, cross stones, which are extremely called kachars, are which are extremely important to Armenian culture. Um, tombstones laid flat. That within a few few years, you've got from 1987, and then by 2005, Armenian the physical presence of Armenia and Nahichevan was erased. And so there's a tremendous concern that our religious um, structures, our historic zones are going to be leveled just as they were in Nahichevan. So you can see in 1981, um, St. Jacob, which was created and it was, was founded in the 12th century is now empty. So now let's connect back to the Armenian genocide. And there's, there's kind of three, there's, Three points in this. One is that specifically with the war and and Azerbaijan with Azerbaijan as the attacker, it comes it brings up the issue of pan tourism or pan Turkism, which was the guiding philosophy of of the Turks in committing the genocide. Also, issues of ongoing denial and oppression of Armenians is extremely important on how we get from the genocide to still being in such a precarious place, experience such tremendous human rights violations 106 years later. So pan-tourism is the idea. It's, 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 it's a, the idea that, that uh, of essentially Turkic nationalism, that, that Turks should control and own zones that, were, that they considered to be Turkic. And so any, so this, the stands are all the kind of the, when you think of like Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, um, Azerbaijan, these are all uh, Turkic, um, these were all invaded by the Mongols and, um, and have this uh, deep historic connection of the shared Turkic ethnicity. And what, um, what the Ottoman Turks wanted to do was to create a coalition um, so that they were stronger against the forces of Russia and Europe. 
in this um, in this move for for pan Turkism, this extreme nationalism based on ethnic identity, the intent to destroy the Armenian people was forefront. There was also the desire to destroy Greeks and Assyrians that and any other non-Turkic people within the Ottoman um, sphere, specifically within the land of, Auto of Anatolia, which is historic Armenia. And so that intent to destroy the Armenian people puts us deeply within, within, the, within um, the genocidal context. And that's something we can talk, like I, I handle in other lectures and we have in all of our materials um, online at um, the genocide education, um, at genocideeducation.org. So the other lens we'll look at is through that of denial. And we use the 10 stages of genocide and um, and looking at the process of, of not only how genocide happens, but how it continues through the use of denial. Um, Israel Charney um, states that denial is the final stage of genocide. It's it's not a um, it is not a um, un um, unviolent act. It has its own level of denial. Has its own level of violence in its ability to continually destroy. Um, a people. And we remember that with the genocide, we're not talking about the, the killing of individuals, but the killing of an entire society that includes the people and their history, their buildings, their, um, their religion, etc. Denial occurs during, gen during and after genocide, that's one piece in which I like to add in and um, because you oftentimes see as, as something is happening, uh, the denial of it, even with Azerbaijan and the war, um, their attack on, on um, Nagorno-Karabakh, as soon as the attack occurred, uh, they claimed that Armenia was actually the one that to attack. Our news services, I'll give them, I'll, I'll, I'll pretend like they had a reason for being so lazy in their reporting, but just took, said, oh, well, if Armenia says that uh, Azerbaijan attacked Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan attacked, says that Armenia attacked Nagorno-Karabakh, then this just must be an ethnic squabble. Instead of actually looking at the evidence of, which was there, of photographic evidence of, of bombs, bombs on the ground. Um, exploding bombs. And so even within this context of the war, you see the, the, the seas of denial um, occurring early. Um, continuing denial triples the probability of further genocide. Denial extends the crime of genocide to future generations and victims. Um, and it has, the, again, the continuation of the intent to destroy the group. Denial is aggression. It continues the process of genocide. It strives to reshape history in order to rehabilitate the perpetrator and demonize the victim. In this image, I have, uh, there's an image of uh, Harant Dink, who was um, claimed, what the Turkish state claimed was an enemy of the state and was set up for assassination simply for creating an ethnically, um, an Armenian newspaper within Istanbul um, that, that was written in Armenian. Tactics of denial, attack the truth teller. Deny or minimize the evidence or numbers. Deny genocidal attempt. Blame civil war. Blame the victims as being disloyal. Deny the facts. Claim that genocide would harm any potential peace process in the future. And that by calling something uh, an event genocide could potentially harm current interests. So these are the tactics. These are all things that Armenians have consistently experienced in not just in Turkey, but in the United States and internationally. And, and Armenia itself has been tremendously impacted due to, to economic trade issues, to um, again, like a continued loss of territory and, and a muted, muted voice on the international stage. Denial is aggressive, but denial is also personal. This is uh, three images from, from, my, from my life. 
And the first one is, or from my family's experience, the first image is um, the remaining members of my grandfather's family um, in 1919 after the genocide. You'll notice that there are three children, well, there's uh, four children in the picture, there's two aunts and my great grandmother. One of the children in the bottom uh, sitting down is my, is my grandfather. His father is not present um, because he was assassinated in the beginning of the genocide. Um, the family was separated. My great grandmother was put, put on the forced march and was able to escape and get back into Turkey with the help of American missionaries. Uh, my, my grandfather and his siblings were, were separated and placed in orphanages. Um, through the acts of American missionaries, they were able to, they, the missionaries were able to pull the remaining members of the family away. There are no grandparents in this picture. There are no cousins in this picture. There are no aunts, uncles, great aunts and uncles. That this is all that remained of, a, of, of approximately 70 members of his, his family. And then in the center of the screen, that's um, that's me and um, and my grandfather, and I think it, I, I included this one um, because this is the man I grew up with. He suffered, um, you know. I he wasn't much older than me when the genocide when in me in this image when the genocide started. He was torn from his family, placed in a series of orphanages, given an, uh, a a Turkish name. I mean, it was only through acts of God that he survived. And, and, he, and he was a tremendous part of, of my life. And, um, and he died without justice being served. And that's, an, that's, that's incredibly painful for me as a grandchild to have so much love for him and, and not have been able to see him receive the justice he deserved, uh, to see, see justice served after, after, um, after all that he lost. The final image is just a snapshot of, on, and really quite frankly, on a minor scale compared to what's happened, but just the, just the uh, I guess the feeling that even within, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, even within my small context, violence touches my life as an Armenian genocide, um, grandchild of an Armenian genocide survivor or third generation survivor. Um, this is an image, our office is based in, the genocide education office is based in San Francisco. And just a few days before the war, um, Aziris in San, the San Francisco area set um, an Armenian community center on fire. Um, the Armenian community center is where our office was housed. All of our materials and resources were burned. We've received threats over the years. We've received threats of lawsuit. We've received violent threats. We've been told not that we will never be allowed in, in Turkey. We've received, as, as a person working in, in this field, I've received threats probably in every, every job I've held. But they've only been threats. And, and this fall, um, I actually, I guess I got a taste of what it was like to have something that you've worked on for so long destroyed um, because of hate. Genocide is also a reality. And, the, and during the war, there was a lot of discussion over like, um, and, and, a, and a lot of emotion over, you know, this uh, was what, what was happening, was this the beginning of genocide? And I think from the armchair scholar perspective, one can say, you know, no, it's not the beginning of genocide. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an attack on a, on a group. But if you look at it from a historical perspective and you look at the words of Turkey and their claims to recreate and an, an, to create a neo-Ottoman you know, state, and, and then you look at their work and, and cooperation with Azerbaijan and taking even more of our land, it is, it is, it is a reality to, it is in a reality for Armenians to see this as as the ongoing process of genocide against us. And to see the international community yet again be silent in um, as we lose what little land we have, you know, these little pieces of land that we have left that we are holding onto um, is, is tremendously painful. And so there's the question of does what happened fit within a schema of whether or not it's genocide? 
Um, that's, that's one question. Or is this the beginning or continuation of genocide? Scholars can address that, and like I said, in the comfort of their ivy towers. But for Armenians on the ground, it is well too clear that any loss of land is, is, on, is, is marked as ongoing genocide, especially when that land is lost um, because of Turkish and Naziri forces. Um, I'm going to leave you with this quote. The gates of Vienna are open in front of Erdogan. There is no, um, excuse me, this little thing is in my way. I can't see the quote and I can't move it either. Sorry, there is no front to contain Erdogan's ambitions and revival of the army of Islam. Actually, and, and which uh, this leads me to my last point, which is that there is still a reason to call, to, to create, um, to, to, to find justice for the Armenian people and the Armenian nation, even 106 years later. If justice is found, if Turkey is held accountable for its actions, then there can be better repercussions and responses to ongoing aggression against Armenians today. It doesn't have to be a back to the drawing board situation. We know what's happened historically. And if they're called to task on that, then our response, international response in the future can be much sterner and swifter. And that doesn't just I think that need for justice, even 106 years later, that applies to the Armenians, but it applies to any group that has yet to receive justice. The World War I left the Middle East in a, in, as a, in a disaster. And, and if we can go back and, and rethink, and that's we as, as, as Western nations go back and rethink the devastation of Versailles, on, on the Middle East and North Africa, we can potentially look at rebuilding a more, um, a, a, a stronger and healthier relationship with the region and, and, and push off any further aggression from, from Turkey and possibly Russia in, in the coming years. So I am gonna stick. So just as a reminder, um, all of our resources are free online. Um, this is images from our website, genocideeducation.org. We have endless numbers of materials. Well, I guess it's not endless because we have a limited amount. Since, uh, but we have we have we have a, a full range of materials for teachers from from middle through high school, from starting with basic definitions of genocide to looking at news reports and various other pieces. Um, this this screen has a few. Um, uh, helpful uh, websites. It's it's too hard for you to read, but if you want this list, I'm more than happy to share it with you. Um, my email is um, is Sarah C at genocideeducation.org. And when I stop sharing the screen, I will put that in in the box. So the one thing I do want to remind you of before you leave is um, is the internet is full of denialist websites. Um, it is really difficult sometimes to discern them. Um, please use the websites that we recommend or that other organizations like ours, including Facing History and Ourselves and the Shoah Foundation recommend um, because it is not always easy to tell what is a denialist website and what isn't. Um, we also um, really um, look down on using Wikipedia because of the constant changes from Azerbaijan and Turkish sources. Um, it's an ongoing it's an ongoing battle with open source uh, websites like Wikipedia. And unfortunately, in the case of any kind of contested issue, um, it's just it's rendered useless. And the last one's a little surprising. Uh, I use travel books. When I, when I first started teaching, I loved using travel books in the classroom. And, but again, when you're looking at the situation of Armenia, 
do be aware that some of the best intended travel writers will allow for governments to edit their books before they go out in return for free trips to the country and access to resources. So even some of the greatest travel writers out there like Rick Steves um, essentially participates in genocide denial by erasing Armenian history from, from the Turkish landscape, which is um, just absolutely unfortunate. So, so you're given, um, you know, we, we provide you with all the, the online sources you could, you could want anyway, but open research online is a tremendously difficult task for students. All right, great. So I am gonna turn it back over to, to Ani and, um, and then we'll open it up to questions. Thank you, Sarah, for that um, really in-depth overview. A uh, lot of lot of really good information. Um, so, because we're addressing teachers tonight, uh, I wanted to provide a little bit of uh, an additional tool that perhaps might be useful in the classroom in uh, you know bringing history to life. Um, a lot of times. Uh, you know, I have a 12 year old son. Uh, when we talk about history, it seems like, uh, you know, a story, something in a book, it doesn't seem live, it doesn't seem like it happened to people. So oftentimes, um, I think uh, a lot of uh, students uh, probably are, are absorb the material better when it becomes real or it's associated with a person, a person, a face, a, a, a name, someone live or someone um, that is contemporary to them. Uh, I had that experience myself uh, after uh, the war uh, in late November, 2020, I went to Armenia and also Artsakh. Artsakh is of course what Armenians call nagorno karabakh um, and uh, I had the opportunity to speak to uh, refugee families. I had the opportunity to speak to families who've lost loved ones in the war um, and uh, also to families who uh, have, uh, you know, children who are still captive uh, or uh, are missing in action. Uh, these are difficult, difficult conversations, obviously. Um, but uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about was this line between the Armenian genocide uh, in the First World War and, and drawing it to modern day, which was, uh, you know, which is the title of our of our discussion tonight. Um, and and the line is very very clear. I've I've done several teacher workshops where we talk about the line uh, going from the Armenian genocide to all of the genocides uh, that are scattered throughout the the twentieth century. Um, but now there is a direct line from uh, the Armenian Genocide to uh, uh, basically Armenian Genocide 2.0 today. Uh, and this is what I think triggered a lot of uh, ethnically Armenian uh, people across the globe. Um, so uh, the, the folks that I, I, I spoke to, uh, about 25 families or so, um, a lot of these folks are uh, were from the regions where they can no longer return to uh, after this war. Uh, the regions of Hadrut, of Shushi, of Karvajar, um, and so on. And so they have no homes to go back to. And these families have a direct history with the Armenian genocide. Uh, their great grandparents were survivors of the genocide and then ended up in uh, Armenia uh, around 1918, 1919, uh, when Armenia was absorbed into the Soviet Union, um, they were still refugees. Some of them moved uh, to Artsakh or Nakhichevan. Uh, during the 70 years of Soviet rule, when both of those regions were put under Azeri administrative control, uh, the areas were uh, forcibly uh, uh, emptied of Armenians, uh, much less successfully in, in nagorno karabakh and Nakhichevan, obviously, but nonetheless, uh, the persecution, the, the oppression was rampant. Um, and as a result, some of these families then moved to other places for job opportunities, including cities in Azerbaijan. Cities including Baku, which is the capital, Sumgait, the second largest city, um, and uh, Girovabad, which today uh, the Azeris called Ganja and is Ganzak in Armenian. Um, so uh, a lot of these families ended up as, uh, as the Soviet citizen 
ended up in cities in Azerbaijan. And uh, when the Ghadapar independence movement started in 1988, uh, under the constitution of what governed the area at the time, which is the Soviet Union, uh, the, uh, the people in Ghadapar itself, nagorno karabakh held a referendum and overwhelmingly voted to uh, unite with Armenia and be separated from uh, Azerbaijan. As a result of this democratic process in Ghadapar, uh, the authorities in Baku, Sumgait, and Girovabad uh, started a campaign of pogroms um, in, in those cities. Uh, and basically uh, uh, drove uh, all the Armenians who lived there, which, which numbered in uh, about half a million, uh, drove the Armenians from their homes uh, in Baku, in Sumgait, and in and, and, and Ganja, and several other smaller uh, cities, uh, creating a refugee crisis uh, in Armenia at the time. So these families, whoever survived, because there was also a lot of killing, uh, and in, in using methodologies that really uh, uh, harken back to the Armenian genocide, uh, rapes, um, uh, slashing of uh, you know, pregnant women's bellies, throwing them off uh, rooftops, all kinds of barbaric uh, processes that really replicated uh, the way the genocide took place in the, in the, in the First World War. Um, so the, the refugees ended up back in Armenia and some ended up in Russia and what have you. Some of these refugees moved on to other countries, some to Russia, some to Europe, some to United States. Um, we have uh, some of the survivors here uh, of ethnic uh, Armenian origin here in the United States. Um, and, uh, uh, but some of them uh, decided to move to Artsakh. Uh, in 1994, after the first Artsakh war was over. Uh, so they moved to uh, Artsakh and started from scratch. These are folks who've lost everything and started from scratch. They, um, you know, worked the land, uh, bought some land, then started to uh, build, you know, by hand their homes, then renovated their homes, then, uh, you know, put indoor plumbing and what have you. One of the families that I spoke to, um, the great grandparents were survivors of the Armenian genocide. Uh, they uh, are refugees from the Baku pogroms. Um, they are now refugees uh, from this war. Uh, the uh, patriarch of the family was killed in the first Artsakh war from 90 to 94. Uh, the son of the family was killed in the 2016 uh, four day war. And the daughter's husband uh, was killed in the most recent war. Uh, the, this is a family that has trauma, 106 years or so of trauma of the same history repeating over and over and over again. And this is you know, repeated across thousands of families. Uh, I think what makes um, uh, this so, uh, I think the reason that this is so difficult for Armenians across the globe and, and you know, all of us here um, is that it really is sort of a repetition of what happened and it's an ongoing process. Uh, and we always say genocide denied is genocide repeated. And that's where that's what's going on today is um, under our very own eyes, uh, our modern eyes where, uh, you know, social media allows us to see these things happening. Um, we are all watching it happen. Uh, watching an ethnic group on their own ethnic land um, being driven out uh, by force, whether that requires killing or just pushing off, uh, the process is ongoing. Uh, and I think uh, it's, it's very difficult for, uh, you know, diaspora and Armenians like myself when we go back and, and visit um, our, uh, the families uh, that are survivors of this current uh, episode. Um, it's very difficult to fathom um, how you do this over and over and over and over again, right? But here we are. Um, and I think that one of the things that's most powerful about um, sort of teaching the genocide, uh, the, the Armenian genocide, um, is that there is such a modern, you know, it, it's happening over again now. And, and the, the line sort of from one genocide to what's happening today uh, is very easy to follow. 
Uh, and I think that uh, Sarah did a great job of talking about the geography uh, and why uh, this keeps happening over and over again and all of the uh, you know, power players uh, in the region uh, that um, basically determine the fate of, of this uh, small ethnic group that has thousands of years of history in this region. Um, I can go into a lot of other details as well, but uh, in order to leave some time for questions, I'll, I'll stop there and go to Roxanne. Um, and I'm obviously happy to answer any questions. Uh, please drop, I, meant, I forgot to mention this earlier, although I put it in the chat. Please write your questions in the chat to everyone so that we can access them and um, are happy to respond. And thanks again for being here tonight. Uh, thank you, Ani, and thank you, Sarah. I can't remember if in the beginning you uh, noted who I am, but for those of you who uh, didn't hear that or don't know, I'm the uh, executive director of the Genocide Education Project, and um, it was fun for me, uh, or interesting, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe fun is not exactly the right word um, to watch as a viewer today's uh, today's webinar. Um, there was a question that Sarah you uh, answered to a certain degree already, but you might want to add to it from a, an, from Pete. Um, he asks, you know, why is there very, such little acknowledgement about the Armenian genocide? Just generally, I think he's talking about. Um, uh, you know, um, while, you know, the Jew, the genocide, the, the Holocaust, the Jewish genocide seems to be kind of the only one that's been talked about uh, to the degree it has uh, and admitted to. Yeah, admitted to temporarily. Um, so we we see trends with Holocaust education, and actually we're in a downward trend right now in terms of teaching. In 2018, a study was done, and it actually shows that in the classroom at this point, there's there's not enough going uh, teaching going on about about the Holocaust. But for most of us, we have some some type of awareness if we've gone through school ourselves. Um, about the Holocaust within the US. Um, in Europe, there's still a tremendous problem with, with recognition, not with Germany, but with many of the countries that also participated in the Holocaust, including Poland, uh, Hungary, Lithuania. Um, and there's, there's just constant battles um, that very much look like what Armenians deal with, um, with Turkey and, and, and issues of denial. But it's a complicated question. I mean, in part because um, I think it's a it's because there were the Nuremberg trials, and because enough uh, 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 Jews were able to escape to the U.S. And um, I, I think a lot of it just had to do with again with Nuremberg, with with understanding, and then um, and then the ability for because of I mean it's a tiny percentage of Americans that are Jewish, um, but even tinier percent that are Armenians. And so I think the ability to organize and, and to get educational efforts off the ground, um, I think you know, other groups are behind. And I think there was also, um, there was a complacency, like if we amongst mainstream educators, not individual teachers, but more within the structure of education that you know, we'll deal with, with this one ethic ethnic group, that's enough. And um, I think that that's changing. And I think it started to change um, some with Rwanda and even more with Darfur. Um, I think a lot of it also has to do with once we left the Cold War behind, um, the like United States in general, we've been more open to looking um, um, more um, more dynamically at, at, at human rights issues. And it's been a Quite frankly, since post Cold War, it's been a very slow process. Um, during the Cold War, we we were really guarded in terms of looking at genocide and other places, and that's still reflected in the fact that the Holocaust Museum, which is a federally partially federally funded program and has to follow State Department laws, doesn't acknowledge the Cambodian genocide as, as genocide. Um, so it's definitely a place where there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of changing mindset. That 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 there's a there's a unfortunately a global tradition of genocide and human rights violations and, and in order to fully understand it we have to take a more um, a more multi-ethnic approach. 
Roxanne, if I may, just to add a couple of other points uh, to this question. I think one of the, the major differences between uh, why the Holocaust, is, the knowledge of the Holocaust is more widespread, although as Sarah mentioned, not nearly as, as much as it should be, um, and the Armenian genocide isn't as well as other genocides, is um, the fact that the perpetrator of the Holocaust admitted to the Holocaust and has made reparations, has tried to make, uh, has, has tried to pay for their sins, uh, but at the very least has, has, has accepted Germany, the state of Germany has accepted that this has happened, that it was their doing and um, has had trials and, and so on and so forth. The Turkish government for the last 106 years has spent millions of dollars uh, uh, and all of their energies and all of their um, uh, ability to cash in on their geopolitical uh, uh, strength uh, to deny the Armenian genocide. It's an ongoing campaign. It's, uh, it's uh, never ending. It's relentless. Uh, it's been a relentless campaign of denial for 106 years. And I think that uh, you know, despite the fact that things like genocide and things like that should be apoliticized and taught in the classroom as part of history, uh, it becomes political uh, uh, very quickly when a government is doing all it can to one, politicize it, and two, make sure that the denial is, is um, successful. I just want to just clarify, there are multiple perpetrators of the Holocaust beyond Germany. And, and while Germany's taken responsibility, like I noted, um, a lot of the perpetrators haven't. I mean, it's just really important because we're still seeing um, not just individuals being persecuted in, in um, Eastern, um, old Eastern Bloc states, but in Central Europe, but um, we're seeing museums erected around anti-Holocaust um, propaganda. And um, and so it's it's a huge a huge issue, um, and uh, and and the issue with um, the ongoing denial. You're absolutely right, Ani, that the ongoing denial of Turkey and the amount of money that Turkey spends, not just with politicians, but within even within districts, school districts, and the districts they target, um, whether it's buying books for libraries in Alabama or providing uh, Native American youth for free trips to Turkey, um, or even within Atlanta, the same kind of process. But there's, um, but there's the, the other level that the U.S. is still in, um, in many ways, in a Cold, they're still shaking a Cold War mindset and, um, and seeing Turkey as a valuable tool. And if they get past, if we can kind of fully remove ourselves from those, the, the Cold War policies, which you know, 30 years later, we still really haven't done, um, we can, we'll see Turkey in, in, a, in a different light. And, and then those actions won't be as, um, their attempts won't have as much impact. Correct. And of course, there's some of that, um, you know, Armenian genocide related as well. Germany, of course, had uh, some amount of responsibility in all of that as well, which is part of history that's still sort of in, you know, in, uh, uh, let's say in- uh, Being uncovered. Research, <laughs> research yeah. Um, a question from Facebook Live, although we're running a little bit late, Sarah, so maybe we can keep it um, a bit short. Um, American education tends to focus on the Holocaust and slavery. Maybe that's a simplification, but uh, while there is an obvious link through the Armenian genocide, are there other links that would allow some context to serve as the foundation for discussing Artsakh? Uh, I'm not 100% sure exactly what it's asking, but I think this issue of making links between Artsakh and these genocidal situations of history. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, I mean, first it's time, and, 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 and to no offense, but actually within schools, there's tremendous issues with the teaching of slavery. And, and that was one of, the, one of the great things about the 1619 projects is that we're hoping, especially um, in kind of a new political climate, that that project will be better embraced in the classroom. Um, if you're interested in any information on um, or reports on the problems with the lack of teaching of slavery or appropriately teaching slavery in US schools, and unfortunately, particularly in the South, um, I'll be more than happy to send you those reports that came out a few years ago and, and the reports on, on the drop in Holocaust education. 
as well. I and mean, we're seeing a real downturn on both ends. Um, but to your larger question of what would be a good parallel in American history, and I think absolutely the Native American case of genocide, because one, you have a denied genocide and you have constantly, you have constant issues with erosion of rights and land and properties. And, um, you know, and, and so, and that's a, so that's a place where we are, um, unfortunately as Americans, perpetrators and, um, and justice hasn't been served. And, uh, you know, I, there's very few states that even, I mean, individual teachers will teach about the Native American genocide, but and acknowledge it as an important part of a curriculum, maybe Native American history, but not Native American genocide. So I would say when you're looking at land issues, when you're looking at, you know, kind of a complex web of, individ of, of indigenous peoples in different spaces and ongoing issues over time, um, I think the Native American case would be a great, great, great um, parallel. Did that answer it, Roxanne? Yeah, and I just put uh, a link to the New York Times uh, 1619 project in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, a really great podcast connected with that as well. I learned uh, so much deeper about uh, American slavery than I had ever had in school when I listened to that podcast. So I highly recommend it personally. Um, yeah, this was wonderful. We hung on to most of our participants. So that's great. I'll turn it back over to you, Ani, to close off. Thank you. Um, really appreciate everyone being on. Sorry, we ran a little bit late. Uh, also appreciate the questions. Sarah, Roxanne, uh, Ge the Genocide Education Project. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for all the insight you've provided. Um, I believe uh, you will be sending the teachers uh, some uh, materials uh, uh, who have registered uh, to participate tonight. And then the, the link to the, the Gen Ed website is actually in the discussion if you guys want to uh, look at more uh, information uh, on the site. Um, also, if you have any additional questions or you'd like to view the, the, the video again, I know that Gen Ed will eventually be putting it on their website. It also aired live tonight on the ANC Eastern Region Facebook page. So feel free to go there to, to look over again if you'd like to take some notes. Thanks again, everyone. And